it, um, it really wasn't that long ago that I found myself contradicting myself. Uh, let, me, let me explain what's going on. Um, I came home a couple weeks ago from a meeting or something like that. It was in the evening time, whatnot. And when I walked into the living room, uh, my daughters were sitting on the couch and they were watching a movie. For the life of me, I can't remember what movie it was, but it was definitely a movie that they had seen hundreds, if not millions of times. Uh, it may have been, you know, Frozen, or it could have been Sonic the Hedgehog. It may have even been one of the Hotel Transylvania movies. If you've never seen the Hotel Transylvania movies, I'm jealous of you. Um, <laughs> but it was, again, it's definitely a movie that they had seen several different times. And, and normally, I would just kind of come in and sit down and relax and watch the movie with them. But for whatever reason, this particular day, I just wasn't in the mood. I wasn't in the mood to watch a movie that we had seen over and over and over and over and over again. And so instead, I, I told my kids, hey guys, why don't you just go play in your room or something? Just let's turn this off. You've seen it a hundred times. You know exactly what's going to happen. You know that this guy's going to end up with this girl. It's fine. Let's just turn it off. And you guys go play in the room. And because my children are so loving and obedient towards their father, they definitely did it on the first time I told them. I didn't have to tell them five, six times and then finally turn the TV off myself. Uh, but as soon as they had left the room, I, I decided to kind of relax myself and watch a little television. And so I, I flipped it over and I was kind of scrolling through the guide to see what was on and I saw it. It was, the ep it was an episode of The Office. And I had definitely watched that episode of The Office five or six times, enough times to where I could have, I could probably stand here right now and recite line for line the whole episode for you if you want. Anybody want that? Dylan does. Nobody else does. It's Dylan's birthday, so I'm inclined. No, I'm just kidding. But that's the thing is I got on my girls about watching this movie over and over again, and yet here I am watching a television show I've seen every episode of maybe a hundred times. And that's kind of the thing with a lot of us. We, we do that, don't we? Like, for whatever reason, uh, my daughters get excited and enthusiastic to watch a movie a hundred times over. I get excited to watch episodes of The Office or MASH or Parks and Recreation. Shows that I've seen all the way through every episode two or three times minimum. I own the DVDs of. And yet, if they're on television, <clears throat> I'm not going to pass up the opportunity to watch it again. And that's something that all of us do, I think, that we revisit television shows that we love, that we've seen every episode of a hundred times, or, or maybe for you, maybe you're not a TV person, you, you prefer to read, you're an intellectual, it's a fancy way of saying you're a nerd, um, but you, you've read the same book over and over and over again, you, you keep going back to it, you want to revisit that time, you know the plot twist that's going to happen around the mid-chapters of it, you know exactly who was the murderer, you know exactly how this is all going to end up when it's all over, you're familiar with that. Or you've, you've maybe, you, you are listening to the radio or something like that, and a Paul Harvey comes on. They still run Paul Harvey's, right? Like, that's still a thing. The guy's been dead for like 27 years, and I think they still run his old radio shows. But you've heard that particular Paul Harvey over and over again. You know exactly what is the rest of the story. But you're still going to listen to it. Because you love that. It's something that we all do. We revisit these stories over and over again that we've heard Time after time after time after time. It's something that we do. When the pandemic first got started, uh, Netflix made a report, of, uh, kind of monitored all the different shows that people were watching. All the different, th I don't know if you know that, but your streaming services that you have, they, they watch, or they, they monitor what you're watching. Kind of creepy, right? <laughs> Makes you really regret some of that stuff. Anyway, <laughs> But, I mean, all the different streaming options that we have in this day and age, we have, we have literally dozens of streaming services that offer us thousands of different options of movies and television shows. And yet, during the pandemic, all the analytics showed every single one of us were watching television shows or movies that had been out for 30, 40 years or more. We were just re-watching this. Instead of exploring all the other options that we had, I mean, well, there was a week or two period where everybody in the whole world was just obsessed with this zookeeper in Oklahoma and all the really weird... If you never watched Tiger King, just don't. Like, 
There's, I, I watched somebody make fun of it or something like that. It's like, I'm finding a hard time finding somebody to root for. And the other person said, I really recommend you don't do that. Um, just don't root for anybody. They're all terrible people. But we all got obsessed with them for a couple of weeks. But more than, more than that, we, we watched The Office. We watched Friends. We watched Sopranos. We watched all the different stuff that's been out for ever. Instead of exploring new options when we had nothing but time on our hands, we went and revisited all the stuff that we were familiar with. I think there's a lot of different reasons why we do that sort of thing. I think maybe for some of us, maybe we, we watch those old television shows that maybe you watched with a parent or a grandparent even. And when you watch that episode, you just you feel their presence with you. That nostalgia just kicks in. I know for myself, anytime I put on the old 60s Batman with Adam West, I'm suddenly a five-year-old who's just discovered the greatest television show of all time. But that's just what we, and we have that nostalgia factor tied into it. Maybe it's, it's more than that. Maybe there's comfort in knowing exactly what's going to happen. We, we kind of know all this stuff that's going to happen. Maybe it's, maybe when we rewatch this stuff, we, we see things that we didn't see before. There's something that goes on in the background that even though we've seen this show dozens of times, I never saw that before. Or maybe there's a line of dialogue that just makes it, it riches, enriches that story even more to you. You just you grow even more fond. You fall in love all over again with this particular show or movie or book or whatever. Or maybe there's a lesson that you, you didn't pick up on. You watched this when you were younger. Now that you're older and you got a little bit more wisdom behind you, you kind of see, oh man, that was, really, that was really solid. Or maybe even it's just the lesson that it is there that's always been there for you in that show or story or whatever it is, maybe it just hits you all of a sudden out of nowhere. You knew it was coming, and yet still there's something about it that just connects with us. For whatever reason it is, though, we love to revisit the same stories over and over again. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I'm not downplaying that in any way, shape, or form. I think that's something great to it, because I think that's one of the things that happens with the story that we're going to be spending the next several weeks diving back into, the story of Joseph. Now, I don't know what your background is with Scripture, but I'm guessing that just based on the culture that we live in, you're at least vaguely aware of the story of Joseph. You know, he's the dude who had that really colorful coat, right? That's always the thing we associate with him. Never mind the fact that that was when he was a teenager and he had so much more life beyond that coat. That's the part we all remember. And there's so much more about the story of Joseph. If we, if we go through, and we are going to go through, not if we go through, we are going to go through. And we're going to explore all the different things that happen in Joseph's life. And Joseph lived maybe one of the most interesting lives in human history. His whole life had amazing peaks and really crushing valleys. He had great highs. He had unbelievable lows. His life had different twists and turns that, frankly, are better than most novels that are available today. And his story happened thousands of years ago. But there's something that we need to keep in mind. And, and you've heard me say this, I don't know, a dozen or more times already in the year I've been here, but something that we oftentimes forget whenever we go through scriptural stories and we look at the stories of the different people who lived the scriptures, that we forget these were real people. Everything that Joseph experienced, he experienced in real time. Like you and I, we know how Joseph's story turns out, or if we don't know it, we can go and read it right now, and we can have that comfort in knowing what the end of the story is. Joseph didn't know what the end of the story was. When he was having those amazing highs, he felt good. When he was having those unbelievable lows, the same emotions that you would feel going through those situations, Joseph felt those. He didn't know what was going to happen next. He didn't know how God was going to use his story thousands of years after his death. He didn't know this stuff. He was a real person. And we can't forget that. Because if we forget that, then we downplay the reality that Joseph experienced. But in my eyes, Joseph's story is so amazing that it's one of those that I love going back to over and over again. I remember being a little tyke in Sunday school. A snot-nosed little punk. The first time I ever heard the story of Joseph, we had a coloring page that Sunday that had Joseph on it. And I got real creative with the colors that Joseph had on his coat. And I think my buddy just made his coat all black because he thought like black trench coats were really cool. But this was a real person whose story that you are probably familiar with, 
but I think it's worth going back over because I think there's something that you probably missed. Joseph's story really begins in our text today. Uh, We're going to be in Genesis chapter 37. So if you've got your Bible, open it up to Genesis. Uh, If you don't know where Genesis is, it is literally the first book of the Bible. So Genesis means beginning, so there you go. Genesis chapter 37, we're going to start in verse 1. Uh, we're going to kind of go through this uh, in pieces, so you know, don't feel like you've got to sit there and read the whole thing right now, but just go ahead and turn there. Uh, while you're turning there, I want to give you a little background on who Joseph is and where he comes from. Joseph, <clears throat> Joseph is one of Jacob's sons. Now, the name Jacob is probably something that you're familiar with. We, we talked a little bit about him last year, if you recall all that far back, uh, but we talked about J- Jacob and his life and that he experienced. And Jacob is actually the grandson of Abraham. He's also the son of Isaac, Abraham and his wife's miracle child that he was born to them when they were way too old to be having babies. And and God has kind of had this connection with Jacob's family for the last three generations. For three different generations, God has interacted with this one particular family. And he has done incredible things in this particular family's lives as they've gone through. And Jacob has experienced some of that. Jacob, like his his father and his grandfather before him, had accumulated quite a lot of wealth. He was a pretty well-off guy by the time Joseph was born. And so when Joseph came into the world, he was born into a family where he really wasn't going to have to want for much of anything. They had just about everything. They were taken care of, not necessarily for life, but pretty darn close to it. But Jacob, as his father, he wanted to make sure that all of his sons, including Joseph, understood the value in hard work. And so he put his sons to work in various ways throughout his his family. They had responsibilities and chores and things that they had to do in order to to provide for their family, to be a part of that. And Jacob, I don't know if you know this, Jacob had a whole bunch of livestock. Like if you get some time today or tomorrow, go back and read through the story of Jacob and read exactly how much livestock he had. And then think about exactly how many sheep and how many goats and how many different things. That's a lot. That's a lot of animals to provide for. So kind of the easiest thing for Joseph and his brothers to do was to take care of the animals. And Joseph was assigned the duty to spend some time with a couple of his brothers shepherding, taking care of sheep. And I've, I've talked to you about sheep before. Blake over there used to raise sheep for 4-H. Sheep are dumb. And if left to their own devices, sheep will die because they just can't help themselves, I think. So Joseph and his brothers are out there having to, to shepherd this flock. And when we, we get this information, when we find out this information from Genesis 32 in, or 37 in verse 2, <clears throat> we kind of see that there's a special connection between Joseph and his father, Jacob. It says at 17 years of age, you remember what you were like at 17? That's fun to think about, right? Think of 17-year-old you in Joseph's eyes. I was a punk at 17. So uh, anyway, uh, Joseph tended the sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhal and Ziplah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now, like I said, I had the um, <clears throat> privilege of having a younger brother myself growing up. And if Blake would have gone to our father and given him a bad report about what I was doing, it's not exactly going to endear him to me. If anything, I'm going to be thinking, when's the next time that dad's not around because Blake's got a receipt coming? Hi, brother. (laughs) That was until he started weightlifting, and then all of a sudden we were cool, like we're good. Um, That's the thing, is if I'm, if I'm the, his brothers that are out there shepherding with him, and he goes to dad, and he tells them how lazy or dumb or whatever it was they were doing that was wrong with the shepherding and stuff like that, if, if my brother were to say that to my dad, I'm going to have a problem. It's not exactly something that's going to make me just be so proud and love my little brother all the time there is. And so it's kind of already established this weird connection and relationship between Jacob and Joseph because Joseph actually felt comfortable to go to his father and say this sort of stuff to it. And and we get a little bit more elaboration on just how connected Jacob and Joseph are as father and son in the next verse. In verse 3, it it goes out of its way to tell us that we need to understand the real dynamic that's going on here. 
It says, now Israel, which if you don't remember, Israel is Jacob's other name. He won that in a wrestling match, which is just fantastic. He didn't win a big gold belt. He won a name. Pretty cool. Um, Too fast for all you? Okay, cool. Not a big, anyway. Uh, But he loved Joseph more than his other sons. Ooh. that's That's a line. Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors for him. So, if you had siblings growing up, you you probably, like I, experienced moments in your life where you really felt like your brother or your sister was mom and dad's favorite child. And if you ever experienced that, you know that that's not exactly a great feeling to have. Now, as a parent myself of two little girls... I now know that that was kind of foolish of me back then to think that because I know what it means to love both my children equally because that's what a good father is supposed to do. Jacob said, nope, Joseph's my favorite. I like him. The rest of you, eh, go over there, do your thing. Joseph. Those moments in, in my life where I felt like Blake was the favorite over me, It didn't make me real happy. They weren't good times in my life to experience that emotion that that maybe my brother is the favorite. It was stuff that made me feel terrible. And it made me rather angry with my brother. Again, Jacob is throwing out all all the whole thing. And if, if Reuben had come up to him, one of his other sons, and said, Dad, I really feel like you're treating Joseph like he's the favorite, instead of comforting him like a good father and saying, No, I love all my sons equally, Jacob would probably respond, Yeah, and? So every time they see Joseph and they see him wearing that multicolored robe, it's another way of reminding them their pecking order in this whole situation. But why is it that Joseph is his father's favorite? Joseph's not the oldest. In fact, at this point in time, he's the second youngest. There's him, and then he's got a brother who's about five years old named Benjamin. Benjamin. So why is it that Joseph, out of all of his sons, would be considered his favorite? Now, the verse tells us that that maybe one of the reasons is because that Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, that Jacob was getting up there in years when Joseph was born to him. But i got to be honest with you, I think there's more to it than just that. See, again, Jacob had 13 sons. That's a a lot of boys. That's a lot of testosterone in the house. But I think we got to understand that they weren't all from the same mother. See, in this particular time, it was kind of common practice to have a few wives. um, To kind of have three, four, whatever you wanted. You could have a dozen if you wished. Solomon eventually would have a lot more than that. So it wasn't uncommon that that, these different wives, they were all going to give him different sons. But if we flip back a few chapters to Genesis chapter 30, we actually learn that Joseph is the son born from Jacob's wife, Rachel. Now that name may be ringing a bell in your head for a minute. Because the story of Jacob and Rachel is one of the most famous stories in Scripture. It's a, it's a story you're, you're probably all familiar with. It's a tale as old as time, to be honest with you. Boy meets girl. Boy falls in love with girl. Boy makes a deal with girl's dad to work for him for seven years so he can marry girl. Girl's dad, day of the wedding, decides to switch out for girl's older sister. Boy doesn't realize until it's far too late. He has to agree to work seven more years to get to marry girl he actually wanted to marry. I've seen it a hundred times in my own life. (laughs) But Rachel is the wife that Jacob actually wanted. Out of all of his wives, Rachel was the favorite wife. She was the wife that Jacob loved. And he worked for, think about that, man. He sacrificed 14 years of his life working for somebody else to build up somebody else's fortune so he could marry that girl. 14, I love my wife. I'm just going to leave it there. I would definitely work for 14 years for her. <laughs> Is she still looking at me? Oh, good. <laughs> but he sacrificed 14 years of his life for this particular woman. And for the longest time, Rachel struggled with infertility. 
They tried over and over again, and she just could not conceive. All the other wives of Jacob were having kids left and right, especially her older sister. Her older sister, if Jacob just looked at her the right way, she's pregnant. And so it's heartbreaking for Rachel over and over again to experience, I just want to give my, my husband a son. And it's not until Jacob's had 11 other boys with his other wives that Genesis chapter 30, verses 22 through 24 happen, where it says, Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son. She said, God has taken away my disgrace. And she named him Joseph and said, May the Lord add another son to me. So, if we take a step back and we look at the whole picture here, we see that Joseph is the son of Jacob's wife that he actually wanted. The wife that he actually adores. He's the first son that she's been able to give him. And he's a miracle baby on top of that. So, while we all think it's probably pretty terrible that Jacob had a favorite son, I think we can kind of understand a little bit why. Right? This is the baby he never thought he was going to have with the wife that he loved more than anything else in the world. And so, yeah, naturally, Jacob looks at Joseph as his favorite. But unfortunately, he treats all of his other sons like Jake, or Joseph is the favorite. And if we look at it this way, if we, if we see the fact that a father is favoring one son over all of his others, we kind of understand 37 verse 4, where it tells us that when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him. That's a strong word, don't you think? I mean, there were times growing up where I wasn't real thrilled with my little brother, but I don't think there was ever a particular time I could definitely say I hated him. And yet, for all of Joseph's older brothers, they saw him and they hated him. It even says that they could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. They couldn't even have a civilized conversation with their brother. Because he's dad's favorite. They, they couldn't stand him. He's, he's dad's special little boy. He's the favorite. He gets that special multicolored robe. None of us got that. We're all wearing hand-me-downs from the brother ahead of us. Joseph's getting this real nice, snazzy. Is that a word that people still use, snazzy? I'm bringing it back. Snazzy-looking robe. Because he's dad's favorite. What a punk. It's kind of understandable. That his brothers were less than happy with Joseph, isn't it? Keep that thought. Hold on to that for just a few moments. We're going to get back to that. As annoying as it is for his brothers to see that, that he's clearly dad's favorite, Joseph probably didn't do himself a whole lot of favors. I mean, we've already seen that he had no problem being a little tattletale and going and telling dad, those boys of yours, they weren't doing a very good job of shepherding. I carried the load. But Joseph also had some dreams occasionally. Now, we've all had dreams, right? Like, I'm assuming if you've never experienced a dream, maybe see a doctor. Um, but dreams are, are kind of a weird thing if you really stop to think about it. You, you go to sleep at night, but your brain doesn't completely switch off. It decides to play a movie for you. And sometimes, I don't know about you, my movies are weird. You get those dreams where just something off the wall happens, like you just... That you wake up just going, huh? Or you get those dreams that are so vivid that you could swear this is really happening, no matter how ridiculous it is. Joseph had dreams like everybody else, but Joseph had really almost prophetic dreams they felt like to him, things that were going to happen. I don't know if you've ever had a dream where something was going to happen. It's not my nose. I'm going to veer off this rabbit trail. It's fine. Uh, several years ago, whenever I was still in high school, I had a dream one night that started with my father and I getting in an argument in that morning. It led with me getting 
a less than ideal grade on a test later on that day at school. And then it led to me being at work at Gabe's Pizza, the best pizza in Kokomo, hands down. Um, I used to work there. It was amazing. I loved it. And it ended with me having a car accident. And I could distinctly remember exactly where the car accident took place. It was right at the entrance of Indian Heights as I was leaving Center Road heading back towards home. That was my dream. When I woke up, my father and I got into an argument. I went to school. I had a test that didn't exactly go well. I went back to work at Gabe's Pizza, and all of a sudden, it's like, all this is feeling a little too real. And I was telling Tony Gabriel, who used to own Gabe's Pizza, maybe the coolest guy who ever lived. If you never knew Tony, you missed out. That dude was awesome. And I was telling him all about my dream. And I was like, and I'm a little nervous to leave here, Tony, because the dream ended with me getting into a car accident at Indian Heights. And I made my way back home. I got past Indian Heights and went, because I didn't get into a car accident. And Tony called me like an hour later. Double B, I'm just making sure you got home okay. What a dude. But I had those kind of insanely almost felt like prophetic dreams, and Joseph had those himself. The problem that Joseph had is when he had those dreams, had a real hard time keeping his mouth closed. Because in chapter in verse 5, starting in verse 5, going on to verse 7, it says that when Joseph had a dream, when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain. Whew, what a fun dream. That's a boring day, and you're dreaming about it? Anyway, there we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered round it and bowed down to my sheaf. This past week, I had a dream. I ate a nine-foot taco. Joseph dreams about grain bowing to other grain. Dreams are weird, man. (laughs) But that's the dream that he had. And his brothers kind of took this for what it might be representing. Joseph's trying to tell him, in my dreams, you all bow down before me. He's already dad's favorite. And now he's having dreams where he's far superior to us. He has another dream a little later on where it's the sun, the moon, and 11 stars. It's an interesting number, 11. He's got 11 older brothers. There's 11 stars, and they all bow to him as well. Come on, man. This guy has got everything going for him already. Our wealthy father loves him more than the rest of us. He hasn't said it yet, but we're pretty much thinking that whenever Jacob dies, he's leaving everything to Joseph, and we're going to be lucky if that punk gives us anything. And now he's having all these dreams where we all bow before him like he's some sort of a king. They hated him. They despised him. They kept hoping that maybe one day Joseph just doesn't wake up from one of his stupid dreams. They couldn't stand him. When we get to verse 11, though, we actually find out what's really going on. Because verse 11 reveals a whole lot to us that I think we miss entirely. And it does so right at the very beginning of it. It explains all these feelings that his brothers have towards him. Verse 11 says... His brothers were jealous of him. And there it is. In that that particular moment, we, we find out they're not just annoyed that he's dad's favorite. They're not just annoyed that he's having all these great dreams about them bowing towards him. They want that. They want just one time for their dad to treat them the way he treats Joseph. Just one time where it feels like things are lining up for them. Because every day they're reminded of their place. They're reminded of how awesome dad thinks Joseph is. They're reminded of how great everything Joseph does reminded of just how amazing Joseph is. 
And they just want that for themselves. They want one time when their dad looks at them with the same affection that he looks at Joseph. They want one time where they feel like they're actually equal with their brother. They're jealous. But I want you to consider something. If we look at what exactly it is that his brothers are jealous of, that he is his father's favorite, that he was born to his father's favorite wife, and that he has these dreams where they're all bowing to him in service, these dreams that feel real, like they're going to happen. What of any of that was under Joseph's control? Joseph didn't get a say about his birth. He didn't get to say who, which mother he gets to be born to. He didn't get to say, I don't know about you, I've never gotten, I've, I've not figured out how to train my brain to give me the dreams that I want. And it shows every time I have a dream. Again, a nine foot taco. It was a delicious dream. The kids like that one. But I've never been able to train my brain. I'm, I don't have control over the dreams that come into my mind. And I doubt very sincerely that Joseph had any control over that either. Everything his brothers are jealous of him for are things he can't control. It's interesting to me that they hate Jacob, or they hate Joseph, but they don't blame Jacob. Jacob is the one who's, who's very publicly stating that Joseph is his favorite, and they're not mad at dad. They're mad at the kid who's dad's favorite, who has no control over the situation. It wasn't, he, I don't think, he, there's no point in time in the text where it says Joseph asked his dad, hey dad, can you make me a real spiffy coat? Yeah, I'm bringing spiffy back too. At no point does he do any of this stuff. It's all outside of his control. He can't do this sort of thing. And yet his brothers are jealous of him. They're jealous of the dreams that he has. They're jealous of dad's affection to him. It doesn't make sense. It's irrational. But isn't that what jealousy is? It's irrational. It causes us to feel bitterness and anger and irritability and a whole host of negativity. It causes each and every one of us to feel pain in some level, to be jealous, to be envious of what other people have. We know it's wrong. We know that we shouldn't be jealous. We know that we shouldn't compare ourselves or anything like that to what anybody else has. But I think if we were to do an informal poll and I ask you to throw your hand up if you've ever felt jealous, every single hand is going in here, except for the one guy that we're all jealous of. Every single one of us knows what it's like to be jealous. When the next door neighbor gets a new mower, come on. When that gal gets just that perfect dress, it's always interesting to me to find the things that ladies get jealous of other ladies about. It's always fun. We get really envious because we, we do this all the time, folks. We play the compare game, don't we? We compare what we have to what other people have. Can I, can I let you in on a secret? All you're seeing is the surface. You don't know what it took to get there. You don't know what kind of control they had. You don't know what the decisions were that they could have on this. The things that you're jealous of, uh, of those people that are around you, probably were outside of their control in the first place. And yet that's what we do. We compare. The reality is, though, instead of comparing ourselves to each other and comparing what your stuff is versus my stuff, is we need to learn how to be content with the stuff that we already have. See, when we, when we allow ourselves to compare, and we allow ourselves to feel that jealousy, all we're doing is we're robbing ourselves of the joy that comes in finding that contentment in our own lives. Of finding the contentment that comes at being at peace at who I am and where I'm at and what I've got and all this other stuff. Every single one of us in here have all been blessed well beyond what we have deserved. Amen? Every single one of us. And yet, we always find ourselves comparing our blessing to the blessing of others. And that gets us absolutely nowhere. It's the thing about jealousy, man. 
It's real. It's a very real thing that we all experience. But it doesn't get us anywhere. Being upset that you've got stuff that I don't have, that doesn't get me anywhere. All it does is lead to pain and misery. It ruins relationships. It ruins friendships. It ruins things that should be considered good. It takes away from. So we have to find some way to find contentment. I heard this really great line a few years ago. I appreciate sure it was from a comedian, but you never know. Sometimes those comedians have really great thoughts. And he said something to the effect of the only time that you should ever look in your neighbor's bowl is to make sure that they have enough. You don't look in your neighbor's bowl to see if you have as much as them. Far too often, we get wrapped up in this compare game. Like Joseph's brothers, we get so wrapped up in what others have that we don't that we miss out on the joy that comes from contentment for what God has already given us. Instead of comparing and being jealous of the blessings of others, we should seek to be content with the things that we've already been blessed with. When we pursue that contentment, we rid ourselves entirely of jealousy And when we get rid of jealousy, we get rid of a whole host of other negative things like bitterness and anger. And we can learn to actually be happy for our friend when they are blessed in a way that you and I aren't. But it comes from finding that contentment in what God has already given us. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to close with this. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We take nothing out. It's a pretty sobering thought, isn't it? If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, which is a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith pierce themselves with many griefs.